Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome everyone to today's webinar hosted by the IBP Network and HRP at WHO. Today we are celebrating World Contraception Day and today's webinar is focused on male country. We'll be talking about research, contraceptive options and policy implications. Next. My name is Nandita Tate, and I am a technical officer at WHO, where I lead the IBP network. Uh, if you go to the next slide, just a quick word on IBP. We are a network housed at WHO in the Department of Sexual Reproductive Health and Research. We are a network of NGO and civil society organizations dedicated to supporting the dissemination and use of WHO guidelines and other evidence-based practices, tools, research results to partners around the world in sexual reproductive health and rights. Um, we recently launched a new strategy and uh, you can find more information on IBP at ibpnetwork.org uh, or on the WHO website. Uh, we are gonna get started soon and just wanna go over today's agenda quickly. Um, we will start with uh, opening remarks from Pascal Alote, the new director of uh, the Department of Reproductive Health and Research here at WHO, followed by James Chiari, the unit head, contraception here at WHO. We'll talk a little bit about WHO priorities. We'll then hear from Steve uh, Kretschmer talking about demand for novel male contraceptive technologies followed by Brian Nguyen from US, USC, who will talk some about the contraceptive clinical trial updates and hormonal methods. And finally, Heather Vadad with non-hormonal methods. Um, next, uh, the webinar will be recorded. Um, just to note that we do have interpretation. So let me just make sure that our interpretation is working. <laughs> um, one minute. Um, can Carolyn or Otto's just confirm that the interpretation is working? Carolyn, I've made you a host in case you're able to set it up. Okay, it's not working. Um, if you'll just hold on one minute, let me see how we can make this work. Spanish is not working. Spanish is not working, okay. No, no. I'm not sure why. Let me just see. English, French. Okay, how about now? Can you please speak uh, the Spanish interpreter to see? Yes, As apologies to our colleagues right, who have joined. Right, okay, we've got the interpretation working. Thank you everybody for your patience. My apologies for that. Uh, just a reminder that the webinar will be recorded. Ahora sí, ahora sí. Antes no. Okay, um, the webinar will be recorded and in French and Spanish and English, and you can find them on the WHO HRP YouTube channel. Um, please do use the question and answer to submit your questions at any time. Uh, we will try to answer them during the session and hopefully have time at the end of the session. And finally, as I mentioned, we now have working French and Spanish, which is great. Okay, next. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to first introduce uh, by recording our di new, newest director of the Department of Sexual and Reproductive Health here at WHO, Dr. Pascal Alote. She has over three decades of experience as a researcher in global health, working across four continents to promote health and well being. We are very excited to have her as our new director. Unfortunately, she had to be pulled away into a meeting, but she sends her remarks via recording, and we will go to those now. 
Friends and colleagues, a very warm welcome to this event to celebrate the rights of all couples and individuals to decide freely and responsibly on the number and spacing of their children. We acknowledge and celebrate the advances in contraceptive technologies and the efforts to ensure access to education and information about contraceptive choices and the integration of sexual and reproductive health into national strategies and programs. The importance of contraception has been agreed by all member states and is reflected in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development under Target 3.7. To date, the burden and responsibility for contraception has fallen on women. The use of the word burden is deliberate. Most contraceptive methods carry some side effects or require proactivity for women. The use of responsibility is also deliberate because the failure of contraception also has consequences, sometimes positive, sometimes negative, for women. Over the last few decades, there has been some increase in efforts to increase male engagement in family planning. This has involved, in addition to other things, the male partner being a playing a secondary role in supporting women's access to and uptake of contraception. The inadvertent outcome, though, is ongoing reinforcement and in some cases exacerbation of gender inequitable roles. I'm therefore really thrilled with the theme of today's discussion, which is on male contraception. It is an opportunity to hear about where the field is in terms of options, to discuss how we engage our male uh, counterparts better in terms of shared responsibilities for contraception, and to discuss developments of male contraceptive methods, ensuring that we embed considerations of equity, accessibility, acceptability, and affordability as integral to advances in this field. Colleagues and friends, let's open up the space to talk about sex, about the options that ensure that intimacy in sexual relationships is based on equality and protects sexual health for all. I wish you a productive and interactive deliberation. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much to Pascal for your remarks. Uh, we are indeed very excited to be having this webinar, thinking about male involvement as more than just supportive partners, but actual users of contraception. Um, just a note, I know there is some might be some challenges with the interpretation, so we are working on the back end to fix that for all of our colleagues who are joining. Uh, please be patient. We will try to get that resolved as soon as we can. Uh, I do want to continue and move on to our next presenter, Dr. James Chiari, uh, Head of Contraception and Fertility Care at WHO. Uh, he's a qualified uh, obstetrician gynecologist and prior to WHO was an associate professor at the University of Nairobi and a consultant at Kenyatta Hospital. Uh, Dr. Chiari, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Nandita. And uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be with the uh, colleagues uh, today on World Contraception Day. Wish everyone a very happy World Contraception Day. And when we can celebrate some of our successes, but also recognize some of the challenges uh, that we have uh, to move uh, this field uh, further forward. I will talk very briefly uh, just to mention how uh, for WHO, how we are engaging in the area of uh, male contraception and also uh, some of our thoughts regarding what is the place for male uh, contraception. So next. So I think if we think about male contraceptive methods, we really must view them in the context of a method mix because we do not anticipate that these methods will come and replace all methods. They will be suitable for some individuals and couples, and others will opt to use other method mix. 
And I know for this, uh, for today, we are all very familiar. I don't need to go to, into what we mean by the method mix, but as we'll talk a bit about it, it both reflects supply uh, in terms of the availability and affordability of methods, but also demand in terms of gland uh, preferences. But you'll all agree with me that as of today, we have really had a challenge in terms of availability of male contraception. And we are not saying that there should be an ideal method mix. Uh, it will vary depending on people's values and preferences. But sometimes when it is skewed or when we see certain methods uh, predominating, it could be due to uh, issues of uh, limited uh, choice. And we view male contraception methods, uh, particularly the new ones that are being developed as really being important to improve uh, this choice. And next. So in this slide, I just wanted to highlight uh, something that already uh, quite as a proportion of individuals and couples are relying actually on male uh, methods, as you can see at the bottom there, uh, with the draw male sterilization and male condoms are uh, significant. The main thing is that this is driven almost entirely by male condoms. And we know that uh, sterilization is permanent. Male condoms sometimes are not used consistently. So there are challenges in terms of the choice that men have on what uh, methods. Uh, they can use. I think as we think more about male uh, methods, beyond uh, pregnancy prevention, they also present uh, opportunities uh, for us to look at some of the non-reproductive health uh, impacts of uh, contraception. And the fact that if we bring in men for to use contraception, contraceptive methods, probably will also have an opportunity to address some of the male reproductive health uh, needs. There's the opportunities for empowerment and agency, and also they will expand the socioeconomic uh, impacts of uh, family planning. And next slide. So as Dr. Pascal pointed out, that there's been a lot of efforts on male engagement in a contraception. Uh, although we don't have like a very specific what it involves, the male engagement, and has been very uh, varied, uh, most of it has focused on men as bringing them in as supportive partners, as clans uh, for uh, vasectomy and for male condoms but also as agents uh, of change. Uh, I think Dr. Pascal mentioned some of the issues that uh, sometimes male engagement, uh, we have to be careful even as we engage men that we must maintain the equity of men and women. It must complement uh, the, the female methods that are being used. And we must not compromise resources or the quality of services to the detriment of uh, women. However, if you look at this space of male engagement in contraception, you don't find good places or examples of where this has been scaled up and sustained. So there's a lot of efforts that are described, but it has not been scaled up and sustained. And one of our thinking around these issues that because of lack of male methods and we are just bringing in men to support the use of female uh, methods, this has been a challenge and therefore we've not been able to, to scale up or sustain male engagement. And I think newer male methods present a real example and opportunity for which we can be able to scale up and sustain male engagement. And next slide. So there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether male men will use these methods when they become available and how will they 
or whether there will be resistance. I think what we have to re recognize is that we live in a world where the norms and rules are rapidly evolving. And while this may have been a challenge before, the gender equity is much more now in the globally than it was before. And as Dr. Pascal has pointed out, this view of contraception as only a woman's responsibility, I think is something that we need to start working to shift. And I believe it's also shifting with the changing uh, norms and roles and paternity responsibility. And also there is more recognition of male sexual reproductive health needs. And uh, so for this, I think the world is kind of in a better place and is probably readier than many of us uh, think sometimes for a male method of uh, contraception. Next slide. When we think about what will these new methods uh, do in terms of uh, contraceptive uh, prevalence, we know that uh, we've always, this is very old, uh, it's not old data, but there's that when you introduce new methods, you then can increase the contraceptive prevalence by four to eight percent. But I think we need to think of this also as a chain of events. Of course, the increased choice means people who did not have available choices may use uh, the new methods. And this may lead to increased uptake and use. But as we will hear today, we need to address various barriers where even with increased choice, this may not lead to increased uptake and use and whether that use would be appropriate to reduce the unintended uh, pregnancy and improve spacing, which eventually is what we hope that these male methods will actually have an impact on maternal uh, and child uh, health uh, outcomes so that to address the SDG goals that we want to achieve. And uh, next slide. As we think about these male methods, we have to realize that they will come into a health system. They will not uh, be provided in isolation. We need to, to think about who will provide them. They, will they be health worker provided or will be the self-care? Will they be uh, requiring minimal or no intervention of healthcare workers? Will they be provided in the community health by the community health workers. And all this has a bearing in terms of the impact as I've shown before that these methods uh, will have. So in terms of where they fit in, which really will be determined by what methods uh, we get, this will determine a lot of their uptake, their use, and whether they prevent an intended pregnancy and eventually lead to different uh, outcomes in terms of maternal health and uh, child health. Next. So from the WHO perspective, these are kind of our key uh, guidelines uh, for contraception. We have the medical eligibility criteria uh, for contraceptive use. The current is the fifth edition published in 2015. And this looks at how one can use the method safely in the context of specific health conditions and characteristics. The selected practice recommendations looks at how to use contraceptive methods. And the, fam the Global Handbook for Family Planning Providers provides a lot of technical information on how to deliver family planning appropriately and effectively. And this is the context which we hope that uh, once we have uh, a new uh, male method, then it will be able to fit seamlessly in these our guidelines and uh, we'll be able to support their use and scale up uh, appropriately. Next slide. 
So there are various uh, research gaps, and I think uh, beyond today, I think we'll be focusing a lot on new methods. I think for for us, we are we are to be very interesting to see what new methods are in the pipeline and what we know about uh, them. But we need to address also other gaps uh, around pregnancy intention. Uh, we need to get better understanding on pregnancy intention and, and men, because that is what will determine whether they use these uh, methods. We need to start understanding how we'll introduce and scale up uh, the methods. And in this, we need to learn from new method introductions that have already happened. I think the implants are one good example that we need to learn how these methods, which we know now have been really scaled up, how are they introduced and why, how are we able to scale them up? We need to better understand demand for family planning among couples, whether people will use male methods additionally or separately or as a replacement. And from the beginning of the, of the introduction, we really need to embed this issue of implementation uh, research. Uh, next slide. So finally, I would just like to highlight some of areas we see for WHO as priorities in this area of male uh, contraception. I, we, I, of course, the method is important, and here today we'll be hearing a lot about the method, and also understanding what gap uh, these new methods will fill. As I've said, we need to understand where they will be in the method mix and what they will bring in addition to the methods uh, that we have. We need to better understand uh, how we bring in the men into this reproductive health uh, space as we introduce these uh, methods. I've mentioned that we need to better understand how we will introduce the methods and how we will scale them and what will be their position in the health uh, system and what guidelines and standards uh, we'll have for this uh, method. So these are the areas that we'll be looking at uh, going forward as we think about uh, male contraception. And uh, next, so I would like to end there and uh, thank you very much for your attention and look forward to the next uh, presentations and to a lively uh, Q&A at the end. Over to you, Nandita. Thank you, James, for that uh, wonderful overview of WHO priorities in this area. Uh, there's clearly a lot of interest. We have over 300 people online and several questions already. So please, uh, James, do take a look at those, see if we can answer some, and we'll save some for the end. Um, but certainly a lot for WHO to contribute in this area with regards to uh, guidelines, um, contributing to strengthening health systems, uh, demand, all topics that we'll touch on today. Uh, before we go to our next speaker, we'd like to introduce a poll just to get a sense uh, from our audience of some of your thoughts on male contraception. So um, I'm going to ask my colleague Ados to launch the poll. Um, why do you think men are hesitant about male contraceptive methods? And you can pick a number of answers. So please take a few seconds um, to select as many as you think. Uh, fear about infertility, cost as a barrier, the perception of contraception as a woman's domain, uh, possibly nervous about side effects, limited choice of methods or other. Um, so we'll give that a few seconds. Uh, we can see kind of all of these. Um, if, if you feel like sharing some of your other reasons, feel free to do that in the chat. We'd be curious to hear um, what your perspectives are from, from the field. Um, okay. So we can still, see, we can see a lot of, a lot of folks still perceive contraception as primarily women's domain. Uh, some fears about infertility, side effects, um, potentially limited choice of methods as James and Pascal alluded to, currently male methods tend to be focused on vasectomy or condoms, 
Um, we'll certainly hear about some other methods coming through the pipeline, um, but very interesting to hear perspectives from our audience. Um, and Ados, if you can maybe end the poll so we can share the results. Okay. So I think you should all be able to see the results quickly from the first poll, just to give you a sense. Um, as I mentioned, there's still um, many reasons why men are hesitant about male contraceptive methods. Hopefully we can help address some of those fears uh, during the subsequent presentations. Great. Well, thank you for, for participating in the poll. We can go to the next slide. And I will introduce our next speaker, Mr. Steve Kretschmer. He's the executive director of Desire Line, uh, a consultancy firm designed to influence and evolve the development sector to realize transformational impact in improving health and well being. And Steve has some uh, interesting information to share on the demand side and acceptability of male contraception uh, with some work that he's been doing around the world. So Steve, I will turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Nandita. Uh, next slide. So this is a, a large set of uh, research that's being completed across nine geographies funded by the Gates Foundation and uh, male contraceptive initiative. And I will take you through some uh, initial um, results. Uh, in, um, in the meantime, I, I wanna start actually with uh, a, uh, talk a little bit about demand and what demand is. Sometimes I think there's a misunderstanding of what that is. So if you go to the next slide. There's within, uh, I think the development sector, there's this idea that we generate or create demand. So we, we talk all the time about demand generation, um, but uh, we can't actually generate demand. It exists in people already uh, in, the, in terms of um, what their interests are, um, what it is that uh, they need to uh, spend their time on, what demands their time and attention, what their priorities are how they try to trade off those priorities, what they need and what they want. And this is uh, actually the, the fundamental um, foundation of human-centered design. So when we apply human-centered design to understand demand, it's really trying to understand what that demand is in people. And then when we develop products and services and interventions and behavior change, um, uh, uh, messaging, uh, we're, when we do that in a way that aligns to We seem to have lost Steve. <laughs> Sorry. Steve, go ahead. Okay, you're back. Go ahead, please. I think my, uh, my internet had a hit there. Um, so when we, uh, when we develop uh, products and services interventions that align to uh, that understanding of, of the demand that is in people, then uh, those products and services and, and those behavior change interventions will uh, be taken up and will work. When we talk about products and services in particular, if you go to the next slide, um, we can understand uh, this through an ad adoption pathway. So it starts with awareness um, uh, about the products or service. There's a, a level of, of understanding, so comprehension and value recognition. Is this relevant for me? Is this uh, meaning what I need? Um, trial, uh, give it a try, uh, confirmation uh, as to whether in fact uh, the value is there, and then retention, whether they'll continue uh, and, and whether they even go on to advocate. So if you go uh, to the next, uh, click to the next, it will add to this. So, you know, in the awareness and comprehensive, it's, you know, what is it? What are the benefits uh, that are relevant to me? If in fact they're relevant, then uh, I go on to trial. If you click to the next one. Uh, 
So is it worth trying? Should I try it? And, and what do I expect? Uh, this was really setting expectations. And then the next one is the user experience. What do I experience when uh, I use the product? This is where uh, for female contraceptives, often we see uh, a trial, but then uh, a lack of retention because of side effects. There are a lot of behavioral gaps that need to be um, uh, transitioned through. If you click the next slide or the next there's initially a knowledge intent gap, then intent action gap. So I want to do this, but do I actually do it? Go on and, and tell others. If you click uh, the next. When we look at uh, what drives uh, people through this uh, adoption pathway, it tends to be marketing and communication, upfront communicating the, the characteristics of the products, of the services, that, that's the messaging. That messaging is not creating demand. What it's doing is communicating the value uh, that may or may not align to the demand that's, that's in people. The core product attributes are what tend to drive trial. So is this really uh, what I want and need? And uh, then the full user experience will uh, realize whether they um, continue using and also uh, whether they advocate uh, for it. Next. So with this understanding of demand, I can talk about uh, uh, some key questions that this research is designed to address and I think are a good portion of, of the questions that are out there around demand for male contraceptives. Next. So the first is, do men want additional uh, male contraceptive options? You know, this whole idea of, of um, you know, it's not uh, man's purview, it's up to the woman. You know, are they, do they even want contraceptive options besides um, uh, vasectomy and, and uh, condoms and withdrawal? Next, um, the next question is what additional male contraceptive options men do want? So it's not just whether they want something, but uh, what they want. Next. Who wants which uh, of those? So. Uh, what we understand is that different men, and this, this is true for you know, demand across everything, uh, different people want different things. And so different men will want different things. And what's important for us to understand is who wants what and how big are those groups in order to be able to support um, uh, them. So when James talks about a portfolio, what's that portfolio look like uh, in terms of aligning to um, the demand that's in men and the various demand that's across different men. Next, there's the question of whether women would trust men to use modern contraceptives to protect them from pregnancy. Next, what will women do? Uh, will they continue using or will they rely on their partner? Next, what will happen to condom use? This is important because of the implications for STI, HIV uh, protection. Uh, next. And then lastly, uh, how might male contraceptives provide an entry point to engage men in healthcare more broadly? Next. So James has really framed the challenge already, but nearly half of all pregnancies uh, are unintended. Uh, Globally, an estimated 257 million women uh, who want to avoid pregnancy are not using safe modern methods. The rates of modern contraceptive use are still low, as indicated in the chart, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, and only half in the relationships can contribute effectively to this use um, because of the lack of options of modern contraceptive methods for men. Next, if we look at uh, the research that's been done to date uh, recently, uh, there's quite a lot that has been done and a mix of qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, but when we look at uh, particularly where it's been done, uh, it's disproportionately focused on de um, developed markets as, a as opposed to LMICs and uh, especially uh, focused on hormonal products. Next. We see a range 
uh, of um, demand uh, in terms of uh, intent to use uh, from as low as 29% to as high as 83% uh, across these different studies. Uh, but different methods were used and different questions were used to assess this uh, across all of these geographies and these different studies. Next. So why do we need uh, additional, uh, particularly large uh, demand research? So we have limited uh, work, as I mentioned, so far disproportionately focused on developed countries and hormonal contraceptives. Um, those uh, are also, a good portion of them are quite dated. There, a lot of them rely on stated willingness or stated intent to use. So, uh, you know, would you use this? Uh, yes or no. Do you want this attribute, that attribute? How important is efficacy, rank or rate these different, you know, directly? As opposed to uh, simulated market assessment where we're putting them in the, the choice uh, uh, um, to, to to decide and then uh, deriving or modeling to what's driving their uh, decision-making, which we can do. Attributes, um, uh, there's been some uh, uh, assessment of various attributes, but uh, there's a wide range of products in development with many different attributes to assess and a better understanding of what of those attributes men want and which of those attributes drive demand. Uh, would be important. Lastly, a lack of market representative quantitative uh, demand uh, data that is recent um, really limits uh, funders' willingness to invest because of all of the uncertainty. It's all of the questions that have been raised, uh, even just in the polling questions. Next. I'll quickly run through uh, just the research design just to give uh, you a sense of the scope uh, of the work and the approach. Next. So uh, you can, uh, you can uh, just continue through each of the builds. Sorry, I should have just left these on build. So go ahead and next, next, next to the end of the slide. So the purpose of this work is to assess uh, latent demand for potential male contraceptives uh, attributes and products uh, looking out to kind of the five to 30 year development horizon. So assessing everything that's in development, breaking those down into their constituent attributes uh, and uh, looking at um, what the demand is in order to particularly inform funding and development uh, stakeholders. Specifically, uh, we wanna assess overall demand uh, for and attitudes about uh, male contraceptives across, across geographies that account for at least 50% uh, of unmet need um, uh, in the FP 2030 countries. Uh, we wanna identify the male contraceptive product preferences, the attribute preferences, and look at how they cluster in terms of what men want uh, into potential products uh, or uh, target product profiles, cluster men according to what they want in order to understand uh, who wants what and be able to size those segments, provide male uh, user-based demand data as inputs into forecast and impact modeling uh, that is being done. So looking at, for example, how uh, or to what extent would uh, introduction of various male contraceptives uh, potentially increase overall uh, MCPR at the relationship level and then assess trade-offs made by female partners, what would they do? Uh, would they uh, continue to use? Would they rely on the man uh, in order to be able to understand that? Next, you can again uh, just skip through the uh, builds. What we designed was a 40 minute quantitative survey among uh, two to 3,000 men and their female partners uh, in each geography. Uh, it uses a discrete choice survey along with detailed segmentation uh, profile uh, questions. Then uh, the inclusion criteria are men who are 18 to 60, have had sex with one or more women within the past 12 months, have not had a, a vasectomy uh, more than five years ago. So we included men within the past five years to ask them what would they have done had uh, other products been available. 
they are able to father children as far as they are aware, and uh, they don't have a partner who has been sterilized, again, the five years uh, in order to be able to assess what would they, have, they have done. And the geographies are listed on the right. So Cote d'Ivoire, uh, DRC, Kenya, Nigeria, and then Bangladesh, two states in India, Vietnam, and the United States to represent a developed country. Next slide. Very quickly, what we're doing is uh, using a listing approach, listing micro uh, areas uh, in, order, in order to provide comprehensive coverage of the country. So we identify primary sampling units, random selection of those, listing of those, then random selection of households within those, random selection of men within those households, uh, so that all of this is, is uh, able to be projected to uh, uh, populations. Next. The sample size is uh, 2,000 men uh, and uh, 2,000 of their partners, or as many of the partners as we can get. We go to the men first and then rely on them to, to um, suggest their partners. We're having very high levels of, of um, completion of that, up to 80%. Uh, the only place that we didn't do that was in the United States. In the United States, for sampling reasons, we have a sample of 3,000. Next, you can again click through this. So there's an initial screener uh, for the um, inclusion criteria that I mentioned. There's an assessment of their current use of methods, including what their uh, partner uses to the best of their knowledge. Uh, then there's the discrete choice uh, experiment. Uh, so they're assessing different uh, potential uh, products based on uh, grouping uh, different attributes and it's all um, designed to be able to undo all of that and understand uh, which attributes are driving demand. Then there's uh, a bunch of assessment of fertility norms and beliefs, channels and access, life stage uh, and sociodemographics. And we use all of those then to be able to profile these groups of men based on what they want. We go to the next slide. This is the set of attributes and levels that are being assessed. So the form of administration, pill, gel on shoulder, liquid patch, microarray patch, auto injector at home, injection in clinic, skin piercing, implant under the skin, nasal spray, uh, and sort of through the urethra and small surgical cuts, cuts in the scrotum. Then a whole set of uh, frequencies of use, time to onset, time to reverse, efficacy levels, impact on sex drive, testes size, ejaculation, energy, uh, mood, and whether it has STI protection or not. So when we uh, interviewed, um, uh, as far as we know, um, all of the, or most all of uh, the developers um, developing products for male contraceptives, when we took everything that's in development and broke it down into its constituent parts, any of those could be, um, developed out of some combination of these uh, attributes and levels. Uh, next, uh, what the men see uh, when they take the survey is just a simple choice card. So they're introduced to, uh, first to the attributes, uh, but then what they see is, okay, here's product X, here's product Y, uh, or neither you just continue doing what you're doing. What would you do if uh, uh, either of these products was available? Um, and so we're able to then uh, through the discrete choice model, not just assess what each of these total products look like, but actually it becomes a giant regression model that uh, has a coefficient for every one of those attribute levels. And we can uh, identify what the um, preference is uh, for each uh, constituent part. Next is the female uh, partner survey. So here uh, it's the man uh, is surveyed uh, it, sorry, she's surveyed uh, if she's married or living together with the woman. Um, uh, and uh, if the woman, uh, it's a full-time or part-time. Also, if she had, uh, he has a partner not living in the same household, but living, living in or near the same uh, primary sampling unit, we had to be at least practical in terms of uh, reach uh, because all of these uh, in the LMIC countries are done face-to-face. The man surveyed has a female partner not living in close proximity, uh, then a parallel female survey would be skipped. 
And if the man surveyed has multiple partners, uh, we would take the one uh, that he considered, you know, that he basically selected as his closest partner. Next, the female surveys are uh, uh, also similar um, uh, in terms of assessment so that we can map back and we're also able to compare uh, between the man's answers and the, uh, uh, his partner's answers. Next, so coming back to then these questions, uh, what I'll do is just walk through each of them and share what we have uh, so far. Sorry, we're just going to try and fix that uh, technical uh, glitch. That, there was something sure. on the screen. Thanks for your patience, Steve. Or no problem. Gonna... Hmm. It looks like it's still there. Now there's something in the middle. <laughs> Yeah, I think but, what it is, is it's, oh, it's, oh, gone. it's gone. Okay, yep. there we go. Thanks. Go ahead, Steve. Apologies, no everyone. So, uh, so we'll start with the first question. Do men uh, uh, want additional male contraceptives? So next. And next. So what, what we're seeing, this is looking at if uh, new modern contraceptive um, uh, male contraceptive was available. And this is after they have done the discrete choice uh, experiment. So they're aware of kind of the many different uh, options that could be available. Um, how soon would you uh, try using it? And we didn't specify a specific one, but basically among what they had seen, if uh, uh, one was available, how soon would they use it? What we're seeing is uh, we tend to look at particularly within 12 months, is how soon would they try it? We're seeing quite high levels. The lowest is in the US at 39% of the year, and that peaks at 78%. Uh, but then uh, really uh, uh, much higher among the LMIC countries. And we think that probably that has to do with just a higher level of unmet need uh, in the LMICs. Go to the next slide. One of the questions is where is this uh, demand coming from in terms of current use? So switching from modern male methods is the red. So you can see a good portion of that. And that's almost all condoms, uh, very few vasectomies within a um, group just given the uh, prevalence. Switching from modern female methods is yellow. You can see in Bangladesh, that's very high. And that makes sense given the uh, high use of OCPs, uh, female OCPs, especially with a lot of side effects. And then new users. So one of the questions too, is if we talk about this idea of, of increasing MCPR, uh, what might men contribute to that if there were uh, methods available for that? Here's, you know, in particular, it's interesting to see how high uh, that is in Nigeria. Next slide. One of the questions too is like, what about uh, uh, married versus unmarried? Uh, and what we see is there aren't actually huge differences. The demand is really across, uh, across the board, whether they're um, uh, married or not. You see the zero for Bangladesh, that's because we only interviewed married uh, uh, men uh, for cultural reasons. Next, so next question is what additional male contraceptive options do men want? Here, uh, next, what we can see is form dominates. So this is the, the form of administration overall as an attribute dominates. And then after that, it kind of varies. Efficacy and time to onset uh, are high. Actually, overall time to onset is higher than efficacy, except for in the case of Vietnam. Um, and, uh, and Bangladesh and the United States. Um, and, and then what we see are the lighter blue bars where there are some uh, bars that are higher. So you see uh, energy, weight, testes size, and sex drive as being particularly important in the United States. Uh, STI protection shows up in the three African countries, uh, et cetera. So there's variation, uh, but overall uh, form dominates. What's driving their decision is the form. 
next. If we look at uh, within form, uh, what do men want? Uh, gel in the shoulder and the pill uh, are most desired. Uh, and then at the bottom, you see small surgical cuts inserted through the urethra. These are least desired. Uh, and then you have the mix really kind of uh, uh, in between. Liquid patch, microwave patch, and nasal spray. There tends to be a, um, a stepwise uh, demand before it drops into injection and skin piercing and implant. Next. Who wants which options? So here, what we did is we segmented on the preference for uh, the contraception. So what is it that uh, you want uh, in terms of attributes and levels? Uh, and then we profiled each of those groups according to uh, the profile data that we have. So we have enthusiasts, most keen to uptake. They have the most frequent sex and sex partners. Um, and uh, you know, they uh, are more likely to commit to a daily pill, though they're uh, quite happy with condoms. Um, grinders uh, really are, um, uh, men who uh, are particularly uh, fine with daily administration, whether it's pill or gel, they're most averse to condoms. Uh, so they'll, they'll go through that uh, daily use if they have to uh, in order to avoid uh, having to use a condom. Moderates uh, prefer an on-demand gel, uh, moderately satisfied with current options, uh, but they're willing to try new uh, options uh, they have fewer kids than average. Hedonists uh, tend to um, prefer on-demand pill, though they're also quite happy with condoms. So they you know, essentially wanna have sex and they're gonna use what they need to, to, to use to um, protect themselves uh, and their partners. And they have uh, generally more sex partners than the other segments. Conservatives uh, have less uh, frequent sex, fewer kids, fewer sex partners. Um, they're moderately satisfied and they tend to have less overall demand. Uh, and then rejectors, uh, men who are happy with the status quo and really aren't interested in using anything new. This just shows uh, how, uh, what the size of those groups look like by uh, country. So of course you can multiply the, the population for each country in order to get uh, the differentiation um, in terms of overall global uh, size, but um, you can see that they're relatively even. And when we look at rejectors, um, you know, they really account for a fraction of uh, all of the rest who have different levels of demand. Next, would women trust men to use male contraceptives to protect them from pregnancy? Next. So if my partner told me he was taking a contraceptive, I would believe him. Uh, the green on the right uh, is strongly agree and agree. And so we can see um, that overall, uh, it's actually quite high. It's lowest in Kenya and, and uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, but very high in, in Nigeria, Vietnam, and Bangladesh in particular. And this is, this is coming from the female survey. Next. So a couple concordance, this is, um, you know, does the woman want the man to be involved? Uh, does the man want to be involved? Uh, so um, the red at the bottom, you know, both don't want the man to be involved. Mm -hmm. Then uh, orange, man wants to be involved, but the female doesn't want him involved. Yellow, female wants the man to be involved, but he doesn't want to be involved. And then green, both want the man to be involved. So you can see, uh, uh, the, um, the fact that there's high demand for male involvement uh, in use of contraceptives um, and uh, over half or, or uh, close to half um, for many of the countries, although it's about a third for uh, Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire uh, for both of them. Next. I can talk openly with my partner about contraception. Here uh, we see strongly agree and agree, uh, really across the board. Um, you know, the lowest is 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 Vietnam, 
uh, at least in terms of uh, strongly agree. And then last on this, if I were using a female contraceptive, I would keep it a secret from my partner. Uh, the disagreement is on the right-hand side. Uh, so again, we see uh, men indicating that they, uh, sorry, women indicating that they would not uh, hide uh, their use of a contraceptive. Next, what will women do uh, continue using or rely on their partner. So first, uh, just looking at willingness to use. Uh, what's interesting here is how close between male and female. So this is overall willingness to use at some point in the future. Um, very, very close on both sides, with the men actually being uh, at equal or slightly higher uh, to the women in uh, intent to use, willingness to use. Next slide. I want my own contraceptive regardless of what my partner is using. Uh, so here you can see uh, about uh, half roughly, except a little bit uh, more in Vietnam, two thirds in Vietnam, of the women say that they want uh, their own, uh, leaving the other half indicating that they're open to not. And we see a strong desire on the male side as well to be able to have their own and not rely on the other. And then next, this is the same chart looking at uh, uh, married versus not married. And again, we see some difference. So uh, not married is a little bit higher, uh, but it's not, it's not substantially higher, which is interesting. Next, uh, this is looking at uh, within 12 months, same thing. So next, What will happen to uh, condom use? Next. So uh, this is looking at um, uh, the uptake uh, and within a year or more than a year uh, and uh, looking at among um, condom users. So what we have are the total uh, proportion here, the proportion who, um, uh, use condoms or relying on condoms. And uh, what we see are red uptake within a year and they have multiple partners. Uh, we're seeing a high uh, uptake, uh, which would be a, a large displacement, particularly in Kenya, Nigeria, and Cote d'Ivoire, where we have high uh, levels of HIV, for example. So these uh, men with multiple partners who are relying on condoms would switch over to these products uh, and not use condoms. Um, and then you can see in Vietnam, uh, uptake uh, within a year, uh, having a single partner, most, most, most of them have single partners. So this raises a concern about the degree to which there might be displacement of condom use uh, uh, and perhaps uh, signals a need for development of MPTs in parallel with the con contraceptives themselves. And then lastly, how might uh, male contraceptives provide an entry point to engage men in healthcare? So uh, next, yeah. There's a lot of discussion about trying to engage men more broadly in healthcare, particularly as uh, in, in LMICs as we're trying to uh, improve um, uh, healthcare coverage for men. To date, one of the main uh, discussion points around that is uh, one of the main points in Sub-Saharan Africa anyways, uh, for engagement uh, with men in the healthcare system, which is for voluntary medical male circumcision for HIV prevention. Um, but that's a one-time thing. And uh, what we need is something that's uh, more uh, regular uh, and ongoing. And so in addition to to uh, meeting demand, uh, to potentially complementing uh, the female uh, use of contraceptives. Uh, this may also open a whole uh, new um, way to engage men in uh, the healthcare system overall. Uh, we can actually actively engage um, them in pregnancy prevention to 
uh, reduce unwanted pregnancies, allows us to be able to engage with adolescent boys and young men in reproductive um, health education, in uh, helping to address a prevention of teen pregnancies where they can play a more active role in that, um, can be a touch point to engage them in gender equity and gender-based violence education, uh, and can be a linkage point for other relevant uh, healthcare services like HIV, TB, screening for NCDs. Uh, and potentially we can reimagine uh, the way in which we engage uh, in healthcare with men and women uh, towards perhaps more of a, uh, an individual and couples uh, opportunity where uh, family uh, planning counseling can happen in a couple's context and they decide together which of them or both of them would use uh, modern contraceptive. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, super <clears throat> interesting. I think you can just skip to the next slides, Autos, until the poll. Um, super interesting presentation. Great to see that there is, in fact, demand for male contraception um, from across regions. Um, I know I was uh, it, that data was quite surprising for me, but very exciting as well. Um, also very interesting to see how you were able to segment uh, the population in your study, very interesting um, work there as well. There's some questions on that as well, how you developed that segmentation strategy. Okay, so um, we have a, a couple more presentations, so, so do uh, stay with us. We're going to go to one more poll before we go to Brian. Um, so Adas, if you can pull up the poll, poll number two. Um, <laughs> The question is, uh, male contraception is relatively new, uh, gaining interest in the past five or 10 years, true or false? So let me just see if it's come up. There you go. So true or false, it's relatively new area and certainly some interesting work being done in that area from our panelists today. So take a minute. Um, We'll see what you think. Again, um, we are not taking questions live, but please do enter your questions and comments if you have them using the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists are responding uh, as they come in if they can. Uh, so do feel free to share questions, ideas, thoughts um, through that mechanism. Okay. Let's end the poll, Ados, so we can get to our results. So most of you, 57% said false. 43% <clears throat> uh, said true that this is a recent area of study for the past five or 10 years. Um, well, let, let, let's, let's go to Brian and, and see, see what, what we learn about that. I think um, certainly there is renewed interest in this area, but I think, um, I think we'll hear that this work has been going on for quite a long time. Uh, thank you, Ados, for the poll. And Brian, we will go to you. Um, we're going to try and, uh, Ados, maybe we can share and reshare so we can get that bar out of the way if possible. There's always some glitches in Zoom. Also, that bar is kind of going wherever the pointer is going. Yeah. And it, I think it's going to move. So I think we're good to go. Brian, uh, let me just introduce you quickly. Brian Nguyen, Assistant Professor, OBGYN, Keck School of Medicine, USC. Um, he's a co-investigator uh, in the Male, Male Contraceptive Clinical Trials Network, doing some really interesting work. Um, I'm going to just turn it over to you, Brian, because I know you have a lot to cover in your presentation. So please go ahead. Sure. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Brian Nguyen, I'm one of the um, investigators for the Male Contraceptive Clinical Trials uh, that are being conducted uh, by the National Institutes of Child Health and Human Development. Uh, and I'm very eager to, uh, to share some of those uh, you know, insights from our clinical trials with you, with you today um, in this presentation called Male Contraceptive Clinical Trial Updates, uh, Guiding Principles and Seminal Findings. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just to start, I have no financial disclosures. Uh, I do have some industry relationships that are not related to male contraception. 
Um, so this should be a talk that's free of bias. Next slide, please. Uh, so just to uh, you know, echo what uh, Steve's presentation said, there have been lots of work uh, on uh, you know, men's accessibility of male contraception. Men are certainly ready for uh, you know, male contraception. And this is just one of the uh, systematic reviews that was conducted uh, fairly recently showing that there were uh, you know, 35 surveys um, that had been done in the past uh, looking at men's desire for male contraception. Um, and in response to uh, Nandita's uh, poll, you know, the, sur the survey work has uh, you know, been going on since the 70s. So uh, really quite a long history of interest in this question of male contraception. Next slide. And next slide. You know, there are uh, you know, surveys that look at men who have actually tried male contraception in clinical trials. Uh, in this little yellow square box here, um, I point out data from the most recent uh, trial of a male contraceptive injection, uh, where the majority of men actually said that they would use it uh, after having completed the trial. Um, next slide. And you can't really see this very well here. And we'll certainly share the slides, but uh, this is just a huge list of population type surveys uh, where we ask men, um, you know, hypothetically, you know, would you use a male contraceptive, usually a pill? Um, and our reported agreement is anywhere between 40 to 50% of men saying that they would use it, uh, which is very, very reassuring. Um, not very different from, uh, you know, what Steve's finding. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and just giving you a little bit, uh, you know, closer look at some of the data from 2002 uh, in a survey of 9,000 men from nine countries. You know, overall about 55% were willing to use the new male contraceptive method. And you know, there are differences between uh, you know countries and different cultures. Um, you know, but overall, again, reassuring. Next slide. Uh, but one of the critiques of these surveys, and I think that some people in the chat have also pointed this out too, uh, which is that it was how applicable are these surveys really? Um, you know, respondents who um, respond to the hypothetical surveys sometimes lack experience with consistent contraceptive use uh, and real responsibility. Um, trial participants uh, can be biased because a lot of these trials are incentivized. Uh, so they might uh, be more likely to uh, report satisfaction with study drugs. Um, and so what that comes down to is that um, self-assessment in these surveys might not be reliable. And the surveys probably grossly overestimate interest in male contraception. Does that necessarily mean that uh, you know, these surveys aren't useful? Uh, and my answer would be no, because even if we are overestimating uh, you know, men's interest in male contraception, the fact that we are seeing as much interest as we are, even if you were to have that, um, that interest, you would still show more interest than we see in surveys with women about female contraceptive methods. And so this brings me to this question of, you know, if we cannot precisely or accurately predict the market for male contraception, um, something I'm interested in is studying how to influence it. Um, Next slide. And so one of the things that I care about is this question of why men want to use male contraceptives. Uh, because I think that by understanding uh, why men want to use male contraceptives, we can uh, better understand some of the factors that lead to these motivations and perhaps even influence these motivations as well. Uh, so you know, I went out to um, you know, talk to some men and I wanted to share some of these videos of men talking about their motivations for being interested in male contraception. Uh, can we click on the first left video? Especially for me personally, I would 100% do that because I would be able to trust myself to like always take it and always be on top of it. And I would feel more comfortable if I was doing it. And even if she was doing it at the same time too, that way there's like double the protection. So what you're seeing from this gentleman is that uh, you know, he actually wants to protect himself um, and have dual partner protection uh, against unplanned pregnancy. And I found that kind of interesting. Um, can we click on the next, please? 
We got to be able to, as men, step up and pull a lot more weight, you know? We all we all are the same men, women, we're humans, and we got to take care of each other. So I think it's important for uh, men to have an extra role or more responsibilities in the pregnancy process. I think we have one more video. You can click on the next slide. There we go. Women didn't have to take the full front and responsibility for male birth control or for birth control in general. Um, I have a daughter and I don't want her to have to go through like major hormonal issues that come with female birth control. If a man can help take some of that burden, I think that's definitely for the best. And so to me, there was um, kind of a uh, a common thread across these three videos, which is uh, men wanting to, you know, step up. And in the last two videos, um, you know, what I heard was a desire for uh, men to take on the burden to alleviate um, some of the burden of having to prevent pregnancy uh, off of their female partners. There was a concern not only for their female partners, but also uh, maybe even their daughters. Um, and these were all very, uh, you know, unique perspectives to me that I hadn't heard before. And I think that um, by focusing on, you know, some of the socio-demographics of men who are most likely to, um, you know, use contraception, we may be overlooking an opportunity to really influence the way that, uh, you know, men see themselves uh, and the responsibility for preventing pregnancy. All right, next slide. Especially for me personally. And so that kind of in, um, is a segue to uh, the next survey that we are working on. So uh, this is uh, so I'm also a uh, male con a male contraceptive consultant to the WHO, uh, and over the past year and a half, I've been working with uh, James Chiari and developing uh, a survey called the WHO Global Study on Male Contraceptive Knowledge, Attitudes, and Behaviors. Uh, it is actually a um, uh, project that we are collaborating uh, on with the International Planned Parenthood Federation. Uh, and in general, it's expected to answer some of these social behavioral questions about male contraception, not just uh, talking, not just thinking about uh, new male contraceptives, but also putting male contraception in the context of, uh, you know, current male contraceptive use and behaviors. Uh, so it is a mixed methods cross-sectional uh, cross study uh, which includes a survey uh, followed by in-depth interviews uh, with a select group of men. Uh, we plan to start in 2023. And the countries uh, that we will be conducting this survey in uh, were selected for diversity and contraceptive and gender equity. And they include Ghana, Togo, Morocco, Bangladesh, and Colombia. Um, our plan is to um, conduct survey sampling with 120 men uh, at family planning and sexual and sexual and reproductive health clinics, uh, and then 120 men from the community, uh, as well as their female partners. Uh, and some of the questions that we're hoping to um, answer from the survey, um, again, center around these motivations for uh, men to want to use new male contraceptives. Um, is it their family size, their belief systems? Uh, is there expectation, is expectations for social mobility? Um, their contraceptive knowledge or experience, their history of pregnancy, uh, their history of abortion. Is it possible that these uh, events in their lives are uh, sensitizing events uh, that can make them more likely to use male contraception? Uh, and then gender roles and responsibilities. Um, you can imagine that across uh, you know, these countries, we may find different uh, you know, gender norms, and we anticipate that those might be linked to uh, willingness to uptake male contraception. Uh, we're also trying to answer how would new male contraceptives fit into men's lives? Um, would there uh, be more discussions with their female partner about contraception, their doctors? Um, and then uh, when it comes to male contraception, would men be more likely, to, more likely to defer contraceptive responsibility to their female partners, even in the presence of male contraception? Or would we see uh, you know, more dual partner use? Um, these are some of the targeted questions that we'll be asking as well. Um, and then there's also the question of uh, comparison to current contraceptives that are being used. Uh, so if men are currently using 
uh, you know, condoms, how likely is it that they would uh, try this method? And then most importantly, if men are using nothing or if a couple is, is using nothing, uh, how likely is it to, um, how likely is that non-use to be impacted by the emergence of a new male contraceptive method? Uh, next slide, please. And so some of the unique features of this uh, WHO global study of male contrac contraceptive behaviors, um, if you can, uh, next slide. Uh, this, is our, this is a schematic diagram or a framework of some of the uh, aspects that we'll be looking at in terms of what drives uh, male contraceptive interest. And so, you know, I spoke to some of them a little bit earlier, but uh, some of these cultural practices, perceived gender roles, uh, and in particular, identification with masculinity uh, is something that I'm particularly interested in as well. Um, you know, is male contraception going to be perceived as something that is masculine for, um, you know, being able to help men uh, you know, control their fertility and support their families, or is it going to be seen as something that is, uh, you know, a woman's job and, uh, you know, feminized for that reason? Um, you know, these are all um, uh, perspectives on male contraception that are going to be important um, to its marketing in the future. Next slide. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I know another unique feature of this uh, study is that we'll be also uh, trying to take a very pragmatic approach um, at examining male contraceptive interest. Uh, we know that when male contraception uh, you know, comes out, um, we'll be addressing a population of men who are, um, you know, number one, looking for a method of contraception, uh, or number two, might just be completely disengaged from the healthcare system. Uh, and we're most interested in, uh, you know, understanding if there are differences between these two populations and if uh, the emergence of male contraception is able to, um, you know, bring one population closer to the other. Um, you know, we uh, are very concerned that men um, in general are not engaging in preventive healthcare behaviors. And so uh, if male contraception can uh, bring them to the clinic, um, then perhaps that may have far reaching implications on uh, men's health in general. Next slide. And so with that being said, uh, you, know, I'm, uh, you know, it's very clear that um, there are um, lots of interest in male contraception, uh, you know, across the globe. So, you know, what are the options and how close are we? Um, so in this, uh, you know, diagram here, what I'm demonstrating is uh, some of is our pipeline for male contraception. So a lot of the methods, which uh, I think Heather is also going to be touching on, um, are in the discovery and early development stages. Um, but the, um, the ones that I'll be focusing on are in the phase one, phase two, phase three, um, which are human clinical trials. Uh, and these are all hormonal methods. And so um, to make it very clear, the hormonal methods, um, you know, even though some people will uh, critique them as, um, oh, you know, hormonal methods may cause side effects, uh, but they are also the closest uh, and the methods that we are, have the most experience with um, that I'll be introducing you to today. Uh, and hopefully um, dispelling some myths about hormonal male contraception along the way. Um, next slide. So briefly, how does male contraception work? Um, you know, I describe it like a thermostat whereby um, the brain, uh, particularly the pituitary and the hypothalamus, um, are constantly sensing what is going in uh, and then controlling what is coming out. And so uh, you'll see in the middle diagram that if there are exogenous progestins or androgens that are detected by uh, the brain, it'll shut down uh, the body's endogenous production of testosterone, uh, and therefore it'll stop the production of sperm. Uh, and that's essentially uh, the mechanism behind hormonal male contraception. It's a system of switches. Uh, so we're not impacting the quality of sperm. We're not impacting the machinery. Uh, we're just turning things on and off, uh, which helps us uh, be very reassured about the, reverse, about the reversibility of male contraception. Next slide. Um, so suppressing sperm to contraceptive levels, it's a common misconception that um, you, need to, uh, you need to 
um, suppress sperm to zero uh, in order to have contraception. In fact, um, we actually have uh, studies where we looked at uh, the chances of pregnancy with varying thresholds um, of, uh, of sperm left. And so while we often do get men to zero, uh, it is not necessary. And the old adage of, oh, it only takes one sperm to get someone pregnant uh, is actually not true. Um, next slide. <clears throat> Um, so who proves uh, contraceptive efficacy with induced, uh, sorry, <laughs> the WHO proves contraceptive efficacy with induced oligosperia at less than three million per milliliter. And what I'm trying to show here is um, a study uh, that was done in the 90s uh, where uh, 400 uh, couples across 15 centers in nine countries um, participated in a one year follow-up of a male contraceptive injection. Um, and what they found is that it took about 105 days uh, for men to have their sperm completely suppressed, um, or at least to uh, oligozoospermia. And then the median concentration that they were able to suppress to was 1.9 million per milliliter. Next slide. Um, and over the course of uh, you know, one year, uh, among individuals who are oligozoospermic, meaning that they had less than 3 million uh, per milliliter, this, uh, there were 8.1 pregnancies per 100 person years. And among the group that was azoospermic, um, there's 1.4 pregnancies per 100 person years. And if you take that together, uh, the entire group, um, we're looking at about a 1.4 um, uh, you know, pearl index. So next slide. And so where does that put that, uh, you know, put male contraceptives in relation to uh, the rest of the contraceptives? Um, what you find here is that hormonal male contraceptives might be just as effective as female uh, combined hormonal contraceptives. So about as effective as the female pill. And one unique aspect of male contraception um, that I always like to highlight is um, on the bottom right here. Um, would have, um, there are uh, you know, new assays that are being uh, tested currently that allow men to test their own sperm count. Uh, and so individuals who are using hormonal male contraception, uh, if they use, uh, you know, one of these at-home at assays, they'd be able to know and be reassured uh, that their method is currently working, that they are below threshold and therefore safe to use the method uh, without any backup. And that's something that's very unique from female contraceptives where, um, you know, you kind of have to use it and hope that it works. Next slide. Um, there is a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, uh, hormonal male contraceptive trials, um, and in particular, one trial that was stopped early. Um, you see a lot of headlines here that we'll keep on bringing up, keep going, um, that came out a few years ago saying that their male birth control uh, injection was stopped early because of side effects. Um, there were some snide comments about men not being able to handle side effects uh, that women handle. Um, and so I wanted to get into a little of that, uh, that history. Uh, next slide, please. And so the real question is, should men be worried about side effects with hormonal male contraceptives? And in, um, in the study that was um, stopped early, it was a prospective phase two 10 center trial uh, of uh, intramuscular injection. Uh, and the design was similar to um, the previous studies where men go through a suppression phase uh, where we make sure that they are able to suppress their sperm counts to um, azospermia or oligozospermia. And we follow them up for a year. And then we also follow them up uh, for a year afterwards to make sure that they recover their sperm counts um, and that um, any side effects are resolved. Um, in total, there were 266 couples uh, who entered the efficacy phase and 42 had self-discontinued their injections. Um, now, um, the study was shut down because of the number of adverse events uh, that occurred. And what's important to know that there was some controversy over it, two different groups, um, Conrad and WHO uh, disagreed over the safety of continuing the trial. and so. Um, it wasn't a unanimous uh, you know, decision to stop this trial. 
Um, what's important to know is that at the time of the trial being stopped, um, the, uh, the drug was thought to be 95% effective uh, with, with a Pearl index of 2.2. Um, again, um, quite impressive. Next slide. And next slide. Uh, should men be worried about side effects with hormonal male contraceptives? So um, this is just a little more data on the side effects that uh, you know, men had with this trial. Um, and most of them were mild or mild to moderate. Um, acne among 45%, uh, you know, mood issues uh, among 31%, injection site pain, myalgias, increased libido. Uh, but again, um, most of the people who um, reported these surveys reported them as mild. Um, of note, there was one case of suicide and one attempted suicide, and also one case of severe depression. And again, this wasn't a placebo controlled trial, and so we can't necessarily know if this was uh, you know, necessarily attributed to the drug, but these are things that we do have to report. Next slide. Um, what people often glaze over, though, is that, uh, you know, after this trial was stopped, um, you know, all of the participants had to be told that the trial uh, was stopped, uh, and they still um, completed exit surveys. And so if you look at the far right column uh, for the recovery phase, R00, uh, you find that uh, male participants were very satisfied, um, and you're looking at about four out of five individuals saying this. And they would also, you know, consider using a method of male contraception like this, and their female partners agreed as well. Um, so despite this trial stopping, um, it was overall very, very successful um, from, uh, you know, these ratings here. Next slide. And so it... <clears throat> And so it's because of these reassuring findings, right, that uh, we are now uh, actively trialing a daily hormonal male contraceptive gel that's, that consists of a combination of mesterone and testosterone. Um, there are, uh, you know, 15 sites across the globe that are currently actively um, recruiting couples. Uh, the timeline is the same as the previous trials where we're trying to follow up individuals who are using uh, the drug for a full year to look for pregnancies. Uh, this total plan recruitment is 420 couples, and we already have 100 couples uh, who have completed the entire trial, uh, meaning that they've already gone through a full year um, and recovered. Uh, and therefore, we are closing our recruitment um, at the end of October of 2022. Next slide. Uh, and so simply, since we have had some individuals who have completed the trial, I didn't want to um, not have you take my word for it, but give you some video testimonial uh, about their experiences in the trial um, and some of their perspectives. Let's start the video. Arrigo Arbolita is here for his weekly check-in. They'll draw blood, look for side effects, and test his fertility. The Arbolitas are part of an experiment they're one of the first couples in the world to try out a new form of birth control, a contraceptive gel for men. I know, it sounds crazy, right? But what if this actually works? Could more choice for men ease the burden of birth control for women? If you care enough about your significant other, uh, a lot of people would consider it. It is something that is, you know, very viable. And next slide. Arrigo. All right, and then let's hear from another participant. So normally I just grab the gel, um, you just open it, and then you would squirt it out onto your hand and just start applying it to your shoulders. For about a year, this has been a part of Daniel Castaneda's daily routine. It absorbs in about a minute or two. No, it's not a skincare product. It's been nice for me not to have to worry about it, um, and it's also fun. 
just to tell my friends, like, oh, I'm actually not on birth control, my partner is. It's Daniel Castaneda and Nina Gonzalez are one of several couples currently participating in trials for this male contraceptive gel at UC Davis. If trials continue to be successful, the drug would be the first of its kind on the market. All right, next slide. And here we have two couples uh, who have completed the uh, trial completely. And so I wanted to get some of their perspectives on uh, how they felt after uh, having them participate in the trial. And I, I just really wish this was like a product. Like I wish this had been available when I was much younger. Like that would have been a lot of peace of mind, you know, for me. People usually start out skeptical, but by the time he's done explaining and we're talking about it, everybody's like, how do we, how do we get this? Putting on the gel every day has made Steven a little bit more empathetic <laughs> to the female situation. Cause if you think about it for a female, it's, you know, if you're taking oral, you have to do it a certain time every day. I can imagine a future where, let's say, this gel was on the market for a long time, that the, nor the social norm might be for both a guy and uh, a girl to both be on contraception. And I think that would be a pretty cool society to look forward to. Mm -hmm. One last couple. Well, I think if this was available to younger single guys why wouldn't they be interested just like young women wanting to take power in their own reproductive health during the study Kristen can't use any other form of birth control but once it's commercially available couples could overlap plus you know the guy may not necessarily know the female that that well at that time so now he knows where he's at now that they're done with a year-long study we may be trying to have so, a some point this year. Yeah. Some point this year, yeah, is is the goal. And they hope the gel will be on the market once their families complete. Oh, I think. It so I hope with these testimonials um, that you were able to get a sense of um, you know the kinds of people who are uh, you know really um, you know breaking up our you know perception of. Uh, who male partners can be. Uh, all these male partners were very supportive of their female partners and wanting to, uh, you know, participate in male contraception. Um, and as you can see, um, they were very pleased with uh, the results. Some of them actually wanted to stay on the drug, uh, you know, afterwards. And so we are very encouraged um, as we move towards the end of this trial. Um, so thank you for your interest. And we'll um, talk about non-hormonal methods next with uh, Heather. Thank you, Brian. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, very thorough. Thanks for covering um, in detail the hormonal methods, how they work, and, and some of your trial results. Also very interesting. Um, before we go to Heather, we'll do one last poll. Uh, so, Ados, if you can pull up the last poll for us, please. Um, and in this, we want to get a sense um, in terms of what, what do you think is the most important factor in a male contraceptive method? Um, effectiveness, cost, ease of use, limited side effects, something that's undetectable by a partner or other. And Steve's touched on this a little bit in his data, uh, but it will be interesting to see what we have here before we move to Heather's presentation uh, where she will discuss uh, some more methods coming through the pipeline, particularly non-hormonal methods. Okay, uh, I do wanna to get to the presentation, so why don't we stop the poll now? Um, share the results and just, just to see um, effectiveness, uh, important factor as well as ease of use, limited side effects, um, kind, of, kind of what we expected to see. Uh, form that Steve talked about wasn't really on here, but, um, but certainly an important factor as well. Thank you for the poll. I'd like to go to our last presenter, uh, Ms. Heather Vadat from the Male Contraceptive Initiative. Um, just wait for her bio to come up. <laughs> uh, Heather has over 15 years of experience in biological behavioral and clinical research, 
and is now the executive director, as I mentioned, for, for the Male Contraceptive Initiative. So Heather, we'll go over to you. Welcome. Thanks very much, Nandita. And hi, everybody. Happy World Contraception Day. I hope um, you're all enjoying the presentation as much as I have so far. And thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the IBP for letting us all come and talk to you about male contraception. Um, so I'm Heather that I'm with the Male Contraceptive Initiative. And I thought what I might do is start out with a little bit of background on us, as some folks may not be aware of who we are and what we do. Um, next slide, please. So who are we? <laughs> so we are a 501c3 nonprofit, um, which is just a tax code classification here in the US. We were established in 2014 um, and basically started out doing advocacy and awareness building about the need for meal contraception. Um, we focused, have always focused exclusively on non-hormonal reversible contraception for people who produce sperm. Um, our first grant was awarded in 2017. That was the first time we received funding to be able to uh, do some grant making. And our current team was established in 2018 and includes myself, uh, Dr. Logan Nichols, who's our research director, Kevin Shane, who is our director of marketing communications, and Catherine Carpenter, who's our advocacy strategist. Next slide, please. So what do we do? This is the slide that I really like to start with because it, it gives you everything, might be a little hard to read, but this is sort of where we always find ourselves going back to root ourselves. So our vision is really reproductive autonomy for everyone, for all. Um, and within that, our mission is to empower men and couples to fully contribute to family planning goals by providing them the resources they need to achieve reproductive autonomy. And the principles we use to get us there are investing in innovation, investing in people, going far together, sharing knowledge, addressing needs and meeting demand, and ensuring um, affordability and accessibility. So I'm gonna to touch on a few of these throughout my presentation, um, and hopefully you'll be able to see how everything connects for us. Next slide, please. So we, as I mentioned, we focus on non-hormonal male contraception. So a lot of times we get the question why, and I think you'll already have seen from um, Brian's presentation and perhaps your own knowledge, there's already great scientists, great people doing great work on the hormonal side. So when MCI was founded, there was really still a need to support non-hormonal um, research and development. One of the ways that we've demonstrated that was in 2019, actually, we put out a small consumer research study based on the US market. And we were able to demonstrate a potential of 17 million men in the US who were interested in using a, a novel contraceptive method. This was when we still had stars in our eyes of the kind of research that Steve presented earlier. So um, we're really excited to see that following up because this is, was where we've been hanging our hat for a few years now. Um, in that, we also found that men are twice as likely to prefer a non-hormonal method as a hormonal method, but that only one in eight of them know the meaning of hormonal versus non-hormonal. And I must say that I've been there as well. So my next slide, I'd like to throw this in just for clarification. Next slide, please. Is hormonal versus non-hormonal? And this is, I'm very much aware of my colleagues on this call. So this is a very high level um, explanation of the difference, but basically hormonal contraceptives impact the endocrine system. So they are you know, involved in much more of the um, various processes of the reproductive pathways in the body whereas non-hormonal contraceptives inhibit activity or development of a specific cell. So a very easy explanation is sperm cells. So if you think of a sperm cell, it's different than any other cell in the body. So it has from differentiation, its own whole host of receptors and targets. So um, it makes specificity um, of a, a specific target a bit easier with non-hormonal methods. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with um, invest in innovation, going back to those principles that I showed you a moment ago. So from here, we've invested $8.1 million in um, non-hormonal male contraceptive research since 2017. Um, that is, it consists of grants as well as investments. Um, we started what we're calling program-related investments, which are actually just re um, recoverable grants or, um, you know, uh, low low risk loans, basically an investment that if the product is successful, then there'll be return coming to 
um, MCI to continue to build the, the pipeline of support. And if there are any reasons that the method doesn't continue, then it becomes just a grant and there's no, um, no beholden um, feedback to MCI for those. We also invest in fellowships and any other support as needed. We, we try to maintain a very open relationship and dialogue with members of the research community so that we're able to meet them with what they need. We're in a position of funding that's a little bit higher risk than some of our colleagues or um, our partners like NIH or um, other, other philanthropic organizations. So we try to really fit in where we can to address other needs. Um, we have a research focused on non-hormonal reversible methods, um, post-meiotic specifically, and I'll get into that in a moment. Um, eligibility is we're able to make grants to institutions and individuals, foreign and domestic, public and private. So come one, come all. <laughs> um, priority research areas for us, as I mentioned, are long acting, post-meiotic, and we're also really interested in post, uh, excuse me, multi-purpose prevention technologies. So we're looking kind of at the whole spectrum of opportunities for investment. Um, one point I'll make is that at 8.1 million, we are the second largest funder of male contraceptive research behind NICHD, um, which is impressive to say, but not when you look at the numbers, it's a rounding error um, in most budgets for developing um, drug products. Next slide, please. So it's always good to have a reminder that the path to market is not fast or easy. So when you're starting, um, you have just a wide swath of, of different molecules and compounds and opportunities that you're looking at. And then you're narrowing that cone, trying to get to FDA approval or EMA approval or WHO PQ approval. Um, and the process at best takes in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 years. Um, we find ourselves in, in the unfortunate position sometimes of having to be a bit of a wet blanket when news comes out around advancements in male contraception because I think people are so eager to get these on the market that any sort of report of progress is immediately conveyed as, um, you know, it's right around the corner. So we try to come back and say, we're super excited about this, but we also want to keep people's expectations realistic about the timeline. Next slide, please. So looking across those research stages on the way to um, regulatory approval, we have um, really built our, our funding pipeline around trying to be as diverse as we can. When we really started this in 2017, many of the products were still in the very early stages. So um, it would have been better to maybe present an evolutionary timeline of our funding across the stages, but this is our current snapshot. So we really try to be diverse in our funding. So we have some products that have moved into clinical, which is new for us um, and exciting. Um, we have products that are continue to advance, continuing to advance, excuse me, through preclinical on their path to getting regulatory approval. But we still are doing a great deal of our funding, as you can see in the screening and optimization basic biology and target identification mechanistic stages. So a lot of early stage work still ongoing. Next slide, please. So these are the four areas we primarily fund across. So we look at um, spermatogenesis, again, as I mentioned, post-meiotic, because we want to make sure that we are staying away from anything that could have an impact on um, future um, fertility outcomes. So we really want to make sure that we're dealing with with sperm that are already developed and preventing them from being um, effective at um, fertilizing the egg. So spermatogenic targets tend to have a two to three month onset. Um, they're assessed by semen analysis. And um, then there's also the issue of addressing time for return to fertility. Um, we also look at sperm transport port. An example of this is like vas occlusives that block the vas and don't allow sperm to, to leave. There are also drug-like approaches that do this. Um, semen analysis is another way that um, these would be assessed for um, efficacy and effectiveness. There's sperm motility, which you know I think a lot of people think of right away as just sort of preventing the, the, the sperm from being able to swim. So this is an exciting sector. Um, it's where you first start to see a possibility of on-demand methods, um, which is an exciting uh, space for both male and female contraception. Um, and then finally, fertilization. So products that are able to prevent capacitation or fertilization um, are really an interesting opportunity for not only on-demand, on but also 
maybe um, combined use. So one product being used by both the male and the female partner or the sperm producer and the egg producer. Next slide, please. So coming back from those four areas, we also try to be diverse across um, the, the target uh, approach. So you can see here where our funding has gone up to date. So in addition to looking at sperm transport and capacitation and hyperactivation, which I mentioned, those are the fertility sides. Um, we're looking at sperm maturation, energy and metabolism, which impacts their ability to swim. Um, but we also look at um, resources and tools. So we funded um, most recently a reintroduction of the, um, the, I always want to say mouse, but it's the, uh, the reproductive genetics database, the mammalian reproductive genetics database, which is an excellent tool for our field. Um, and the folks um, that have done that work have been presenting it all around and um, it's Baylor College of Medicine and Dr. Thomas Garcia. So if you can find it on our website, but you can search for that as well. We also have a database of non-hormonal reproductive targets that folks can look through to look for ideas for research. Um, and then we've developed some platform, or we haven't developed, excuse me, we've supported some platform technologies that help with um, spur addressing sperm count and um, understanding how to better um, characterize fertilization in, in mouse models, those sorts of things. So we do try to, to really paint a broad brushstroke so that we can support across the, the spectrum here. Next slide, please. I'm gonna give you a quick run through some of the real products that are in the pipeline of our fund, uh, funded projects that give examples of these different areas as well. So next slide. First, uh, in the spermatogenesis sector, we're funding um, Your Choice Therapeutics. They're doing a RAR alpha or retinoic, retinoic acid receptor alpha. Um, this molecule prevents the production of new sperm. And the grant that we are providing them um, facilitates work that will help them progress towards first in human studies and eventual approval with FDA here in the US. So that's an exciting study, um, an example of something at that far left early stage um, sperm development uh, process. Next slide, please. Then uh, for sperm transport, as I mentioned, vasoclusives are a great example of that. We are funding Contraline. Um, they've been a, a grant recipient in the past. They were the first recipient of one of our program-related investments, as I mentioned earlier. And again, these are targeting more mature products in our pipeline that would still likely be getting grant dollars from us, but this allows us to build in some sustainability for the um, development program. So this is also part of something I'll get to in a second that we call team science, which is scientists and researchers in this field um, investing in each other. So really that concept of a rising tide lifts all boats. So we were so excited that Contraline was our first um, PRI recipient. We were able to award them a million dollars and are really excited to see them um, continue to succeed. That funding has helped them move towards their first in human studies, um, which I think are undergo, they're just getting ready to undergo the initial um, injections right now. You can see the little cartoon down there is a quick ex explanation. Um, a polymer is injected into the vas deferens and it prevents the sperm from um, being um, ejaculated. And then over time, the, uh, the injected polymer will dissolve and it becomes, um, it's, sorry, everything's going off here. It's its own um, self-dissolving self uh, product. So that makes it a very exciting um, opportunity as well. There's no re removal needed. Next slide, please. Epin um, is an example of a uh, product that's targeting motility. So as you can see, Epin has received multiple grants from MCI over the years. Um, this is a, a project that started out of the University of North Carolina and has moved into um, a standalone company. And um, Michael and Catherine have been doing great work on this product for years now. Uh, our recent, most recent awards have been helping them also progress through the IND enabling milestones so that they can achieve regulatory approval and start first in human studies as well. Next slide. Um, this is a, another example for us, and I apologize for some of the, the text being covered here, um, but this is a fun example because this is really an example of multiple areas where MCI invests. So we're investing in the research through a traditional grant. This is um, 
the soluble adenocyclase or the, the um, SAC inhibitor. And um, this is being managed out of Wild Cornell College of Medicine. So uh, doctors Lonnie Levin and Yelkin Buck, who you can see in the pictures there, have a grant for this, but we've also supported two fellows in their labs. Um, Melanie Balbach has completed her, her fellowship with us, and Carla Ritagliati is a current fellow with us. So it's been a really neat way for us to, to demonstrate an opportunity to really build not only on the research, but on future researchers in the field for a very exciting target. Um, this target stands to potentially be an on-demand method, so this is one to, to watch as well. Next slide, please. Some other products that I wanted to mention. So um, another product that you all might be familiar with is Vassal Gel. This is um, another vasoclusive hydrogel product. Um, Parsimus Foundation has done a valiant effort in carrying Vassal Gel for years and, and arguably non-hormonal male contraceptive momentum as well. Uh, uh, Parsimus recently signed over licensing rights to Next Life Sciences um, earlier this year. So we're really excited to see the energy that that organization is bringing to the product and we look forward to seeing basal gel um, continue to move forward. Um, similarly, there's been a lot of discussion about thermal methods, including the COSO device, which many of you may have seen. Um, this was a James Dyson award-winning ultrasound-based device that is currently in development. Um, and recently um, the, the International um, Consortium for Male Contraception was in Paris, and there was a lot of discussion in the presentation there, um, including some activists that showed up to present their interest and demand for thermal methods. So there's, there is ongoing work in those areas as well. Um, and I also wanted to mention Vastablock, which is another occlusive device. The mechanism of action is slightly different in that it is um, injected through the urethra versus directly into the vas. Next slide, please. So investing in people, as you'll recall, that was another of our principles. So I mentioned our fellowships. These are um, up to $50,000 a year for two years. Um, we've had an amazing cohort of fellowships over the years. These are our current fellows that are either in year one or year two of their fellowship. We really see this as an opportunity to help continue to foster the next generation of contra male contraceptive professionals and um, scientists. So every year when these come in, we're just blown away by these fabulous um, young professionals and we can't wait to see them continue to grow. This is also an opportunity to let everyone know that this is something that's available. Um, the call for um, proposals or applications for the fellowships go out early in the spring every year. So keep an eye on our website or subscribe to our newsletter to keep abreast of when these are announced. Next slide, please. We also believe that youth and student advocacy and engagement is important. Um, obviously, when we're talking about the timelines required for development, this isn't method, a method that I or you know, my peers will be using, it's really the next generation. So not only do we need to get them engaged and aware of what's happening, but we need to get their voices included. So we spend a pretty good amount of time and um, that's what Catherine, my colleague, spends a lot of time um, focused on is youth engagement. So. We're trying to foster the interest in male contraception among young people and students um, support, you know, even earlier stage interest in the, the field of male contraceptive research. Um, and then their target audience so we can include them in our activities and strategy development to make sure their voices are heard. So we do that in mul multiple ways, which I'll get into in a second. Um, this is sort of a bigger slide to catch a few things that didn't fit into our traditional program. So we have master's level students that we work with, um, we can now say around the world, which is exciting. Um, we have a summer fellowship program that we do with the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We have a spring fellowship that we do with a local undergraduate program in public health, North Carolina Central University, which is a historically black uh, university. And then we just started our first um, fellowship this year with Kenyatta University with some master public health master's students as well. So lots of exciting opportunities there. And we really look forward to partnering with more universities and students in the future. Um, we also uh, partnered with over 30 computer science students at uh, Saskatchewan Polytechnic, which was a, a story that we can get into at another time, but we've connected with them. And it's been a great um, non-traditional partnership in that you know they aren't in the science field 
or the public health field necessarily, but they've created video games as a way of um, providing educational information. So next slide, please. We also have a youth advisory board, which sits firmly at the center of our youth efforts. Um, they connect with young people 18 to 27, uh, also continuing to, to focus on increasing awareness and bringing discussions about male contraception to young people. Um, this is open to anyone 18 to 27. Um, we have youth membership or YAB members from uh, also around the globe, which we're really proud of. Next slide, please. Um, and one of the, the big opportunities that the Youth Advisory Board was able to launch last year was an undergraduate research award, which was a pilot program. And we were able to find these four fabulous young people from around the world who were undergraduates looking at male contraception. So it was really interesting to see that the interest, you know, is there at so many levels. You know, we've heard Steve talk about, you know, demand, but there's also this intellectual demand for having um, opportunity and advancement in the space. So we're really excited. Um, Parsmas Foundation uh, helped support the pilot program and has doubled down their support for the 2022 follow-up. Next slide, please. Go far together. Um, what this really means for us is what we started with the, our current team is we really acknowledge that the, the scientists and research community working in the, re, the male contraceptive space is really special. Um, it's a bunch of very, very bright people, very collaborative people who've been working together for decades trying to just continue this pursuit. And that's built their relationships in a very unique way. So we've really brought them to the table and said we that we as MCI appreciate that and want to continue to foster that level of collaboration. So we've had some um, some cross-learning events, some ideation events. The first one being in San Francisco in 2019 and then the world being what it was, we had a, a virtual one in 2021 with Australia. So these are opportunities for these for researchers to come together and really collaborate and brainstorm in really crazy ways. And it's really a creative outlet and so much has come from it. Um, and we have written a paper on um, how we view team science as impacting the future of male contraception. So um, that's available on our website. Next slide, please. And then finally, sharing knowledge. This has been an important aspect for us because we do a lot of traditional dissemination, consumer research, as I mentioned, peer-reviewed publications. Any of our grantee publications are posted on our website and we promote them. We have podcasts and webinars, blogs, social media. So we have that nice foundation of traditional um, information dissemination, but we also, if we could move to the next slide, as I mentioned, have done some fun things like video games with Saskatchewan Polytech. We have six video games now that I encourage you to check out. We've really embraced memes as a fun tongue in cheek way to talk about um, male contraception. We've written um, educational videos just because as we are gathering information for our own infographics and information, we realize there's a real need for information and tying back to a point or several points that I know that James mentioned, um, we really have also put an effort into linking the sustainable, sustainable development goals to male contraception so people can really understand the potential profound um, far reaching impact. Next slide, please. And just parting thoughts, I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but um, each year there are 85 million unintended pregnancies around the world. And next slide, the total contraceptive funding 95% comes from public and charitable resources. So it's really a small community doing a great deal of work. And I'm proud to be part of that community. And I'm proud to be presenting to you all today um, as part of that community as well. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Heather. Um, really interesting to hear about all the work that MCI is doing, particularly interesting to hear some of the non-hormonal methods coming through the pipeline and the work that you are doing uh, around advocacy for male contraception, um, especially among young people. Really great work. To our colleagues on the line, you know, we're at six o'clock so uh, in Geneva, so I don't think we have time for questions. Before we close, I just want to remind everyone that the webinar was recorded and will be available on the WHO Media HRP YouTube channel, as well as on the IBP network website, um, along with the presentation, so you can find the slides there. Um, please do visit the WHO website for more information on male contraception, along with the many other topics that 
WHO is working on in sexual reproductive health. Um, again, this, this session was in celebration of World Contraception Day today. Uh, we have several events this week. Um, tomorrow we'll be hosting another webinar on country impact of family planning programs. Uh, so do encourage you to join that. We'll be hearing from colleagues from Niger, Sri Lanka, and DRC. And on Wednesday, in celebration of Safe Abortion Day, um, we'll be launching a series of implementation stories, one of which does feature male engagement in safe abortion services. And you can join that webinar on Thursday. With that, I would like to thank all of our presenters for your excellent work and uh, time today putting together these slides. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at WHO, uh, Ados, Carolyn, and Maria Fernanda for helping on the back end, and a special thanks to our interpreters for working so hard to make this available to our colleagues uh, in French and Spanish as well. So thank you again to all of our panelists and of course to the audience. We had over 300 people join and stay for the entire two hours, which speaks to the interest in this topic and the engaging presentations from our speakers. So with that, I would like to wish you all a happy World Contraception Day. Let's be champions for male contraception. Uh, have a nice evening. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.